diets don't teach modification for the long haul. They just control you for a short period of time. Welcome to the Rebel Health Coach Podcast with Tom Underwood. Armed with truth and knowledge, your journey to a healthy lifestyle can be obtained. Preventative wellness, quality nourishment, and daily fitness routines dramatically improve your outlook on life as a whole. And you'll find the support and info you need to accomplish a healthier lifestyle here. Together, we can empower each other along our journey to an amazing you. Okay, on today's episode, I have Kelly Lutman. Kelly is a best-selling author, a nutritional consultant, and founder of Pursue Wellness. She is also a certified health coach. Kelly uses functional medicine principles to help her clients put disease into remission without use of drugs. Kelly, welcome to the Rebel Health Coach podcast today. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Ah, uh, man, I'm glad to have you. I, and I, we're, today, we're going to talk about Kelly's book, From Diet to Edit, which I really like what you did uh, and the play on words there and the, moving the letters around. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, that's brilliant. Thank you. The book is fantastic. I, I recommend you get it. And I put the book, how to purchase the book in the show notes. It's very easy to read. It's not a difficult read or hard read, and you could read it in a weekend without a, without a problem. I do like the fact that it's, it's for a person that wants to change what they're doing, and it's very simple steps, and, and it's not ro- this isn't rocket science, Mm-mm. and this book is really amazing, and I, and I encourage you to go purchase it. But today, we're going to pick a couple things to talk about from her book. But before we do that, I would like you to tell us about yourself and how you got into uh, health coaching and functional medicine and why you decided to leave your position as a CPA and do this. It's actually been a progression. Um, I, I joy, playfully tell people I'm in my third career. Originally trained as a CPA or accountant and CPA. And then as I had children, I felt I really need to be home with them and left the workplace to, to raise my kids and actually started homeschooling my sons. And in the process of homeschooling them, when you're with them all the time, 24-7, you begin to observe a lot more. And I realized one day hearing a parent panel discussion on the radio program of parents talking about their ADD kids, that one of my sons would have been classified ADD if he was in a classroom setting. And so then I had to deal with, what do I do with this information? Am I going to take him to the doctor, get him diagnosed and be pressed to put him on medications? Or is there another approach I can take? And I, this was before the internet, long time ago, and I found a book in the library called Why Your Child is Hyperactive by Dr. Benjamin Feingold. And Dr. Feingold was a pediatric allergist who discovered that as he removed foods that his patients were sensitive to, they often were able to come off their medications. And so he pursued that further and fine-tuned it to identifying salicylates, which are used as preservatives in artificial colors and flavors, and noted that it was actually an allergic reaction to artificial colors and flavors, or primarily the salicylates in them, that often caused hyperactive behavior. And he developed a full protocol that was a two-week process of completely removing all those from the diet, as well as some fruits and vegetables such as oranges and tomatoes and um, various others that have natural salicylates in them. So you are coming completely away from those in your food for a period of time to allow your body to relax. It's much like we would do an elimination diet for food sensitivities as a health coach. But we did this protocol as a family. I wasn't going to short order cook and tell one son, you can't eat this, but everyone else can. We just as a family changed our diet for that two weeks. And at the end of the two weeks, I had a different child. 
it was such a drastic behavior change that you couldn't, you couldn't argue the point. And it was kind of one of those aha moments. Wow. The only thing we changed was our food and look at the difference it made. And progressing from that, we continued in that panel, that, that direction. We were able to reintroduce many of the, the natural forms, the, the fruits and vegetables, and identify what were triggers for him and what weren't. But, you know, Kool-Aid, Jell-O, all those were completely out of the house for the rest of his life at home. And I learned a lot like, Margarine is artificially colored, butter is not. So we switched to butter. Yellow cheese is artificially colored. Cheese would naturally be white, except for the color they're adding. So there were a variety of things that I found beyond the Fruit Loops and Kool Aid and Jello and things that you had to watch for those artificial colors as well. But I could tell after that if my son went to a friend's house and played and had a snack that wouldn't have been an option at home because he wasn't really tight on his parameters when he was away from me. As soon as he walked in the door, I could tell that he'd had something that his body was reacting to. It didn't make him bounce off the walls, but there was a different energy level and a different being factor. Wow. <laughs> he, he lost his focus ability at that point. And so we continued that way. And when we would travel, I would be prepared to, or if we visited family, I would give them some outline of these are the things that we kind of need on hand so that he can eat and not be bouncing off the walls and such. But that was really what started me interested in food as a therapy <laughs> and started researching and learning more. And then as I finished graduating all of them from high school, one at a time, I started focusing on my own training and went to school at Inter um, Institute of Integrative Nutrition and then later found the School of Applied Functional Medicine, which gave me even more tools in my toolbox to be able to help people. Wow, that's awesome. All, it all started with family. It all started with my own experience, which is usually the case, I find. <laughs> it's, yeah, very much so. Uh, very much so. And uh, usually it is the person that, like, your, like myself or yourself, that had issues that wanted to change. But this was happened to be your son. And that's the whole ADD world to me in in is amazing in itself because so much of the symptoms can be resolved with food. Right. And yet we put them on medication as quick as you can snap your finger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because it seems easier than having to make a conscious decision about changing right. your food habits. Well, that's like anything. And then we'll get to that. It's, even, it's diet. I mean, the di from diet to edit, in my opinion, and you say it in your book, diet's a four-letter word. I believe it's a four-letter word because it's because of the f fact that it is, people say, I'm going to go on a diet. Well, that means there's a start date and an end date. Mm -hmm. In reality, it's a lifestyle change. Yes, yes. So if you have a start date and an end date, that means you're going to go back to what you were doing beforehand. Right, exactly. That diets don't teach modification for the long haul. They just control you for a short period of time. Some of them can be kind of wacky. <laughs> Some of them can be really extreme. And so many of them seem to focus on that calorie thing as though calories rule it all. But you can go on a diet that where you eat a thousand calories a day of Pop Tarts. And you will lose weight, but you will also lose function because it's not nourishing, you know, whereas a thousand calories of fruits and vegetables and quality protein is going to also help you lose weight, but you will fuel your body for function in exchange for the changes you're making. Well, then you, to your point is what happens with calorie restrictions. There's other things that happen inside the body when we're restricting our calories that actually help you 
cause you to gain weight. Right. Or, or hold in one place. You right. know, people complain I'm on a diet, but I'm on a plateau. It's because your body is metabolically trying to buffer and protect itself. And so it, it actually starts to work against you because it's afraid of starvation. Right. And I mean, I say this a lot, but God gave us an amazing body for a reason, mm-hmm. including our own filtration system to filter out the, the toxins. Mm-hmm. So to your point about your body going into feast or famine, mm-hmm. and you get to a point where, okay, I'm starving. And what most people do is go ahead and eat. Mm-hmm. So therefore, you already goofed up. That puts in your in your mind a bad mindset that I that now I I'm a failure. Yeah. Then it becomes an emotional issue in addition to a nutritional issue. So yeah. yeah. It's it's just that's why I say diet is a four letter word and we need to to be more conscious of that. So let's go into uh, the, some of the edit phases of your book. I don't want to cover the whole book because uh, I, we don't have time. Right, right. <laughs> and, that's, I would have done an audio book if we wanted to do that. Right, <laughs> if we wanted to do that. I do want to touch on some of the points that I find that with my clients uh, struggle the most at. Mm-hmm. And then one of the first ones that I picked out was edit your pace. Yeah. My clients are usually entrepreneurs or successful corporate executives that are always running and always on the go, including myself. I, I mean, I eat my dinner many times behind this computer screen on my desk, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which is horrible for me. So edit your pace. Let's talk about that because we, we have become a society on the run, especially with uh, you know, kids in school, as you you homeschool, but a lot of mothers don't have that option. So they're right. dropping their kids off, picking their kids up. They have sporting events. They have uh, dance class. They have football practice, baseball practice, basketball practice. So we're all on this treadmill. <laughs> yeah, this treadmill. So edit your pace. Let's talk about that briefly. Well, let me just briefly introduce the concept of changing from diet to edit. You'd referenced it earlier. And edit is also a four-letter word, but not in the negative connotation. (laughs) That if you just picture what I share in the book is if you just picture diet spelled in the magnetic letters on your refrigerator, you know, from when you have kids around. But if you take that E and you take it out of the word diet and you move it to the front, you actually get edit. And my My theory is that making daily edits is more sustainable than running a week or two or one month long diet program. The key is sustainability. That if you are equipped with edits that you know meet your needs, you can make choices wherever you happen to be, whether you're eating out at a restaurant or you're having to eat on the run or you're eating at home. And so one of the ones with pace, that's the first one I address in the book, is just because we are this on-the-run society, um, my dad was a U.S. Marine, and he was eat-it-now-taste-it-later approach from (laughs) from his uh, early days in boot camp. And so I tend to eat very fast, and I have to make a conscious effort to slow down and chew Really, what we don't realize is chewing is the only thing that we can control in the process of eating and digesting. And so take control of that very valuable step of chewing the food in your mouth, which is both a mechanical and a chemical process. Mechanical in that you're actually using your teeth to grind and and break down the foods. But in the process, the saliva introduces enzymes for the chemical process to begin breaking down carbohydrates and different food processes. And so taking the time to chew it other than chomp, chomp, swallow, that's not really chewing. That's not really tasting. (laughs) That's just inhaling it. (laughs) So if you take your time and really chew, and you know, some people may actually need to say, okay, I'm going to chew 10 times before I allow myself to swallow. And even that can be really hard. But 
if you think about how you chew gum, you don't chomp, chomp and swallow that, you know, otherwise you would have sticky innards, you know, everything glommed together, but you actually chew and then you slide the gum to the side in your cheek and you swallow the extra saliva and then you put it back and you chew some more. You can do the same with your food. You can chew for a couple times and then if it's not really soft and mushy yet, slide it over, swallow, bring it back and chew some more. And in that process, especially when you're eating protein, you need time, you know, a piece of steak, a piece of chicken, you know, those foods need to be broken down well. Otherwise, you can almost imagine your stomach in a meteor shower. You know, whomp, <laughs> here comes a chunk of meat. Whomp, here comes a half-eaten carrot. Whomp, here comes a piece of bread or something like that. You know, it's all being invaded by all these meteor showers of food that is not really ready for the stomach. And so the stomach has to work all that much harder whether it's in using more chemical process or the stomach can also use a mechanical with it being a muscle and actually massaging the food that's inside of it, which can lead to acid reflux. If the stomach is low in stomach acid and not able to do the chemical side, it does a little more of the massage and it can squish stuff up out the esophageal sphincter and cause that acid reflux. So really stopping and giving yourself the time, first of all, to chew. And secondly, to even if it's 10 minutes, can you stop for 10 minutes, set a timer, and purposely sit and chew the food you have? You will do vast benefit for your digestive system if you'll give it just that much. You and I have learned through our schooling that when we are eating on the run, our sympathetic nervous system, the fight or flight nervous system is in in control. And that tends to shut down the digestive system in favor of boosting the lungs, the heart, the muscles, and the eyes. So you're not even set for digesting anything. But if you are sitting in the rest and digest parasympathetic system, your body engages breathing and digestive juices and the whole digestive system to better process and utilize that food so that it's not sitting there waiting for when you finally calm down and give it a chance to eat or to, to digest. I think that's part of the big part of Thanksgiving in the recliner after the Thanksgiving <laughs> dinner is your body forces you to relax right. in order to be able to deal with all that stuff you bombarded it with. <laughs> <laughs> all right, exactly. And I, I can relate to your father's uh, being a, a fellow military man. Yep. And they give you like 10 minutes to eat. And it's like, okay. And you know you're not going to get another 10 minutes to eat for another six hours. So. You, you, so the idea is get in right. as much in as you can. <laughs> yeah. And it's sad because to your point that our, our bodies aren't made for that. Right. I mean, there's hormones involved. There's, there's hormones that help us realize that we're full and, and hormones that digest, you know, there's, there's a whole, it's a, like you said, your mouth is the, the only thing we have control over. Mm-hmm. Chew, the chewing the food is the only thing we control. Yeah, that's good. That's I like that, and it, it's something that many people work on, have to work on. I mean, when people come to me and say I'm not losing any weight, I'm like, okay, well, let's look at what you know some of the things. And and one of those many times is well, you're eating like whole pieces of chicken. You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're not yeah. chewing the chicken up. Right. So pace can is the first thing I work with. You know, first first thing. I want to talk about edit your portions because portion size is something that most people struggle with. Mm -hmm. And also, and this kind of relates to edit your pace too, because you may not think you're getting a lot of food if you're eating it fast. Right. But you're getting more than you need. Yes, exactly. So there's some, for those of us that eat out or we go to the restaurants and eat, and 
those of us that don't know what proper portion size is, there's just some key fundamentals to discuss here. Protein, first of all, we have the portions of these of these proteins, fats, uh, dairy. If you're eating dairy, uh-huh. uh, cheese, if you're eating cheese, uh, cooked vegetables and raw. So let's start with protein. What's, what is the size reference for protein? Is it for female and male or is it both? Can we- I generally give kind of an average for both. Um, okay. And it's, it's not what you see in the average steakhouse. Um, because you go into a steakhouse and happiness is having that steak cover your plate. And then the side dishes have to come on separate dishes, literally. Maybe that's where they got the term side that's dish. That's what I'm talking about right there. <laughs> but really, the, the portion that is reasonable for your body is a quarter of the plate size okay. or better yet the palm of your hand okay. because we get into these you, know, you see a wide variety of plate sizes even if you go into a store shopping for dishes you'll see you know the the smaller 8 to 9 inch plate but any more people are really going for the big 12 inch plate and so your portions are going to vary even if you're saying a quarter of the plate there's a big difference between an 8-inch and a 12-inch plate right. as far as the quarter coverage. So I usually say, okay, think of the palm of your hand, and that's going to naturally increase a little bit. You know, I know men whose palms are much larger than mine. So if I gauge it based on my palm or my body, it's a little bit safer portion. And then you can actually use your hands in, in all portion sizes. So if you're eating raw vegetables like a salad, two hands full, and I mean, you know, think of a softball in your hand type. You can eat a lot of raw vegetables. Right. Um, one handful if it's cooked because it tends to cook down and reduce in its its portion or spacing. Right. And then fats, maybe the from the knuckle to the end of your thumb would be one to two tablespoons of fat. And cheese is a portion of your full thumb length. So it, I introduce some measurements to give you guidelines, right. but I'm also talking about the whole plate in terms of a quarter of the plate is protein, half of the plate is vegetables, and then a quarter of the plate can be whole grains or more vegetables. Some of us just do better without a lot of grain in our diet and certainly not processed grains. But um, I'm from South Louisiana. Red beans and rice is the the Monday meal. (laughs) And actually, that was because Monday was laundry day. And red beans could be cooking over the stove while they did laundry in the old days. Wow. And then the way they cooked rice, they would save the water from their rice to use as starch when they did the ironing the next day. So there's all a historical thing to wow, Monday know, red beans and rice. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting. But in our locale, when you order red beans and rice, it's going to be a plate full of rice smothered in red beans. And that's an overload also. So I tell my clients, okay, think in terms of a quarter of the plate covered in the rice and a preferably brown rice. And then a quarter of the plate covered with the red beans, but you can mix them up. And then the other half put your vegetables on there because they typically didn't do a lot of vegetables other than what was cooked in with red red beans. So you can still do your traditional foods, but just modify your portions to be a better balance of um, nutrients for your body. Okay. To sign up for my monthly newsletter, text... R-H-C-P, that's Rebel Health Coach Podcast, or Red Hot Chili Peppers, to 22828. Again, that's R-H-C-P to 22828. Thank you, and have an awesome day. With nutrients, talking about nutrients, we're going to get into that right now. Okay. Because this is one of my favorite chapters. Is edit your colors. Yes, yes. And I'm not sure. I'm, I'm probably going to screw up her, the pronunciation of her name. Is it Diana Minnick? Eating colors. Actually, I'm not familiar with her. Okay. Surprise! I guess okay. I need to go look it up. 
<laughs> it's probably not a really new concept, but I introduce colors and I start by just saying, hey, we've all eaten at fast food places. And if you unwrap all that food, what's the typical color you're eating? Brown, Brown. white, Brown. boring, unless you add ketchup or mustard, then you get a little <laughs> bit of color in there, but it's not much for value. And so that is not representing a lot of nutritional value because the colors in our food are actually an expression or a representation of the nutrients in our food. And the most colorful place you will find in the grocery store, besides the cereal box aisle, is the produce section. Right. Lots and lots of colors. You know, people usually think of green. Okay, green. But sometimes people will think, oh, rabbit food. (laughs) Right. But green represents a lot of nutrients. Chlorophyll is is a nutrient for the plant as well as for our body. Um, and the nutrients in our greens, and I recommend darker greens. I grew up eating iceberg lettuce, which is basically water and fiber, <laughs> not a whole lot of nutrient. Right, now right. I eat the darker greens, romaine lettuce, kale, spinach, things like that, because the darker the green, the more the nutrients are in there. But those nutrients can upregulate de- detox for your body. They certainly provide a wide variety of phytonutrients, different plant nutrients in your body. And then another color that people often think about is red because we're familiar with red tomatoes and red apples and things like that. And red is a more common food if people are looking for different colors. But then we forget about yellow and orange and blues and purples. We have to be a little more purposeful to get the blue and purple in there. You know, blueberries at certain seasons, purple cabbage, eggplant. You know, there's a variety of different choices that you can find in each of those color groups. But when you can mix up the colors you're eating, it's really visually more appealing to your body. And then that visual turns into your cephalic phase of digestion, which starts the juices going. When you walk into the the movie theater, what do you smell? Right. Popcorn. What does it do? Make your mouth start to water because of the cephalic phase of digestion. And so incorporating those colors, I've actually found that when you can present children with a plate of the rainbow of colors, they are more likely to explore eating new foods because the colors appeal and draw them. Mm. Whereas if you just feed them the browns all the time, they tend to get just kind of stuck in a rut. But I've explored this with my grandkids. And when I can give them and talk about, let's eat the rainbow. Let's eat all these different colors. Look at what we can have. Orange can be an orange or carrots or pumpkin or different squashes. White is a color and we tend to eat white, but I try to avoid white potatoes in favor of a sweet potato for the orange. And then, of course, onions, allium, vegetables are are often white. Cauliflower is very beneficial as a white vegetable. Jicama is one that people don't often know about. so yummy too. You have to go looking for it on purpose to even pick it out because it's not real appealing in the grocery store shelf. But it's usually over with the, the sweet potatoes and the yams. It's actually a Mexican parsnip, I believe it is. Um, and if you peel the outside, which is brown and not exp- not exciting, you peel the outside. Inside is a sweet white flesh that is crisp and a little bit juicy, and to me tastes like an apple pear combination. You know, but it's delightful. And I would never have expected that to be inside that wrapping. <laughs> you have to get past the wrapping and give it a try. But that's a great white item, can be cut into sticks to eat like carrot sticks or cubed and put in a salad. Lots of different ways you can use jicama. Yeah, I put it in my salad a lot. I cut it up in, into little thin slices, yeah. kind of like a yeah. radish. Uh huh. And put it in my salad because I love the sure. taste of it. Sure. I really do love the taste of it. Some other white ones that I, mush, I, I'm a mushroom freak. Uh huh. Because of the benefits of the benefits of it. But my, you know, are mushrooms white or brown, though? Usually the flesh goes more to the white side, I think. I, I count mushrooms in with the white. Um, and technically, they're not a vegetable. They're a fungus. But, you know, they do have nutritional benefits. I guess you're right. 
And, you know, you will get some variation in colors. Of course, if you roast a mushroom, you know, if you, if you start with some of the bigger varieties and, and you roast them, they're going to turn brown. But, um, but on average, I consider them to be in the white. I, yeah, that's why I was wondering if they were the white or the brown. And I mean, there's a lot of benefits to all these colors, you know, and you list them in the book. And, and Sure, sure. And, uh, and I provide recipes yeah, I, to incorporate the I'm ideas. I'm glad you brought I, that up because I did not put that in my notes. Ah, yeah. I try to incorporate some recipes to just give you places to start in incorporating. One of my favorite is the roasted uh, root vegetables. That's a great way to get a wide variety of color in one plate. And you can do a big batch and eat off it for several days. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I love root vegetables. And this is my favorite time of year, the fall with the squashes Mm -hmm. and the pumpkin. And I'm not a big fan of all the pumpkin flavorings. I'm talking real pumpkin. Yeah, yeah. Go for the real stuff. It's got the nutrients. Squashes. (laughs) All the squashes are coming this this time of year. Acorn squash, uh huh, butternut squash, spaghetti squash. Oh yes, and those are oh, yes. so delicious. Just and they're so easy to cook. You know, yeah, yeah. They seem like a, a a foreign object if you're not accustomed to them, right? But you know, just Google a couple recipes or some ideas. You know, cooking butternut squash or cooking spaghetti squash. My husband loves to, we, we will open the squash and clean out the seeds and then he'll put it in, put a little water inside it and actually put it out on the smoker and smoke Ooh. the squash. And then you get a bit of a smoky taste in with the vegetable content, um, which is another unique way to use it. Huh. <laughs> Takes a little longer to cook it that way. Or you could, you could bake it in the, in the oven and then smoke it to finish it, so but to speak, smoking that way. the whole but, thing yeah. would be really, really tasty. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'd probably get thrown them on a thrown out of my apartment, <laughs> <laughs> that, or the fire well. department would show up. <laughs> so, smoking them sounds delicious. I didn't even really thought of that. That's brilliant. I can tell you're going to work that one over. I'm for a while. Gonna, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love my I love my fall vegetables. Yes, I love this is. A great time of year to go to the farmer's market and just explore what's on yes. what they have. Yes. One thing I, I like the greens, kale is such a beautiful plant. Uh-huh. I mean, people don't think of it as beautiful, but if you see a not the commercially grown kale, I'm gonna eliminate that. But you get like farm raised kale, it's the most amazing looking thing. It's so delicious. Yeah. And I, I laugh because my oldest son worked in the cafeteria at college. And the first time I put kale on the table, he said, mom, this was all decoration for the buffet. <laughs> this wasn't <laughs> stuff we ate. <laughs> and I thought, what a waste. <laughs> what a waste when you've got that awesome vegetable. I love, I, I have a massage kale recipe in the book. That what I love about it is you can make a big batch and kale doesn't wilt like romaine and other lettuces do. And so make a big batch massaging the olive oil and the avocado into it. And you can eat off that for two or three days. Oh, very good point. I So I didn't you think can about simplify right. the process. You know, I'm big into if we can cook once and eat multiple times, all the better. Right. That's how you get through the busy life, you know? A hundred percent. I mean, if that way you have, I didn't realize, I, I forgot about that point, that kale doesn't wilt as, or wilt as fast. I think, I'm sure it will wilt at some point, but it doesn't wilt as fast mm-hmm. as mm-hmm. your lettuces and your spinach. Yes. Uh, some of the red ones, I'm thinking about red. Radishes. What else you got for red? Radishes. Peppers. Peppers, Peppers you know, strawberries, Stra- yeah. Um, you know, this- what's that? There's one I'm trying to think of. I can't think about it. I can't get it off my mind. Or maybe it's the purple, but and also they make different colored carrots too, like red. Oh, those are ex- those are kind of fun. Um, I like to do those with my grandkids. It's like this is a carrot, but when we sl- you slice those, they're different colors outside to inside, and so those can be. Another color exploration with children. I wonder if they have a 
different chemical makeup is you know like is an orange carrot have a different couple is it, that's a good question yeah that's I a really know. i haven't explored that they still are going to have beta carotene, but you know when you get the purple one, ones that are purple on the outside, they're going to have a different nutrient balance. Yeah, where does uh, garlic fit in? Is that, is that the the white family? I usually count garlic more as a seasoning okay. or flavoring. Okay, not so much. You know, it still does have nutritional properties, but herbs in general have a lot of nutritional benefit. And there's a whole chapter on the herbs. Flavorings, yeah. Um, Flavorings using ginger, using garlic, um, and the medicinal side of ginger and garlic. But so I don't count those so much in the colors of vegetables as in the chapter on flavor. I like to take a, a, we're getting a little off subject, but take one of those, get one of those elephant garlics Mm. and then roast it in the oven. Uh Uh-huh. That's a that's amazing. With olive oh oil. yeah, oh that's, yeah. That's like and heaven. you know it 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 helps inside to fight disease, but your breath keeps the people that are sick <laughs> away from you too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea. How do you that's think a about win-win. that? Hey, I can't go near that man. He just ate an elephant garlic. <laughs> that or you share it with yeah. someone so they yeah. can smell the same. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go into uh, sweeteners. Is a hot topic. Oh yeah. So we're going to go into edit your sweeteners. It's such a hot topic because there's so much misinformation on the World Wide Web. Yes. And there's so much misinformation from people you talk to, including uh, health coaches, uh, doctors. You know, it's just it's just a, a it, it's a very interesting. Be- because every now and then we want to have, we want to engage our sweet tooth because the connection between sweets and the mind is so powerful. Yes, yes. And that's why sweeteners are so hotly debated. There's a physiological and emotional aspect to it in addition to the flavor and the taste. There have been so many studies out there. If, if, people will look at them when they found that an infant, you know, just a couple months old who had been, you know, connected and bonded with mom, if they dipped the pacifier into sugar and put that in the infant's mouth, they could actually draw the infant away from mom and get the infant almost redirected to somebody else. Wow. Because of sugar's mental and emotional and physiological effect. And so people will fight for their preferred sweetening effects. You know, it's people will say, I can't detox sugar. I can't get away from sugar. No way. You're not going to take that away from me. And as health coaches, you and I both work with our clients in that way. But there is a lot of misinformation. Of course, you know, you you Google anything and you're going to find misinformation. <laughs> yeah. but, um, but understanding that artis- artificial sweeteners are not better than the, the full-on regular processed sugars. Right. I would actually tell a client that was just adamant about their, about their soda intake, I would rather you drank regular than diet version just because of the chemical effects of the chemicals in those sweeteners. Exactly. I found, I experienced with my mom, who was a big diet soda drinker when I was younger, found that the pink packet, um, the saccharin packet was very addictive. I haven't found a lot of definitive studies that talk about what saccharin does in your body, but it has been connected with cancer. It has been connected with digestive issues. Um, so then we shifted over to the blue packet and that became available. And that has been clearly demonstrated to affect the brain. Right. That it, it's an excitotoxin that passes the blood brain barrier and can actually cause your blood, your, your brain cells to self explode, you know, self uh, destruct. And so then they came out with the yellow packet, sucralose, that was supposedly better. But Sucralose has been clearly demonstrated. Actually, sucralose was developed in an effort to look for a new pesticide. And some lab assistant somewhere 
violated every lab protocol and tasted, got, had some on their hands and tasted their finger and found out it was sweet. And they took it in a different direction based on that. So it was designed as a pesticide originally, and it kills the microflora in your gut. So, you know, that opens up a whole new can of, you know, what are you doing to your, your um, immune system, to your digestive system, everything else by consuming a lot of sucralose. So there's really no great, I, you know, I, I, beware the colored packets. <laughs> beware the colored packets. If your choices were the colored packets or the brown raw sugar, yeah. I'd rather have my client have the brown raw sugar. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. I would agree. To me, even better would be uh, raw local honey. And the benefit with that is you are process, you are exposing your body more to local allergens if you tend to have a lot of hay fever or a lot of environmental allergens. Consuming raw honey that has been harvested by bees locally gives you almost a, an effect, an allergy shot, an inoculation against that, those allergens. And I've had many clients find that their allergies improved when they were consuming raw honey. The key is to get it from your local area. You can buy raw honey online, but you don't know where it was raised. And so find those beekeepers, go to the farmer's market and find the person selling local honey to be able to get that benefit. But then you've also got the option of stevia. And that's my alternative I recommend. I actually grow stevia plant. It's related to the chrysanthemum plant in my backyard. Um, I haven't found an effective way to be open of using it to sweeten my foods. Very, you know, you can't just drop a couple leaves of stevia in with your brewing tea and have it really sweetened sufficiently. But I do dry it and then pulverize it and add it into smoothies for a little bit of sweeten effect okay. at times. But when I look for a stevia, either in packets or in liquid, I look for minimal ingredients, preferably stevia extract and maybe a nosotol for fiber or something like that, and just keep it to the minimum. There are many brands out there, many of them produced by our prominent beverage companies that have five and six different ingredients, including dextrose, which is corn sugar. <laughs> so you're not really getting an artificial sweetener or, you know, a, a non-sugar sweetener. But a lot of people complain that stevia has an aftertaste. And what I work with my clients on then is the portions they're using. If you were used to, and I have honestly seen people in restaurants put three packets of sucralose in their tea. Right. And I cringe. So if you're switching, switching to stevia, don't do three packets. It's going to be way too much sweetener and then have that bitter aftertaste. Start with half a packet and work up if you need a little more sweetening effect with half a packet. Surprisingly, agave has been promoted as a healthful sugar. And I don't agree with that because yeah, agave either. is also very highly processed and it ha has more fructose in it than corn syrup. You know, we complain about the high fructose corn syrup and how that's not healthy for you. But agave has much more fructose than corn syrup. And that's a stress on your liver that you, we don't need to be adding stress to. I want to go back to the honey for a bit. Okay. Because there's other than the ability to reverse allergies allergies mm -hmm. it does it, it is an antioxidant also yes it has and and an good mineral supply right also. it has uh, like yeah iron potassium to b vitamins calcium it's it's, it's 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 yeah i've tried bee pollen in my shakes for allergy control okay so that but it goes along the same lines as the honey it needs to come from local your local farms, right? To combat your local allergies. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about in Stevie is uh, you brought it up briefly was the brands <laughs> because Stevie is a hot topic also <laughs> because there's a lot of junk Stevie out there pro made by our big big food companies. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's look at your brands. You know, you want to keep your ingredients minimal on the on the Stevie. So, and no dextrose is to your point. Right. So, right. 
when you're baking, we have a whole, you know, you've got this, you know, if you're baking brownies or you want to make, you know, something sweet. And I know some of these bars that I eat are now using dates Uh to sweeten the bars. Yep. Dates, coconut sugar is another option that is being, becoming more readily available. And to me, coconut sugar tastes like a cross between brown sugar and molasses. It's got a little bit stronger flavor than brown sugar, but it's lower glycemic than a brown sugar or white sugar because it's got a higher fiber content. So it slows the glycemic transition and glycemic load. So that's another option. If, and it's a little harder to bake with honey because it's not the solid you know, recipes are designed with the, the solid dry ingredients and the liquid ingredients. And so your consistency can change, but um, coconut sugar can work or soaking dates and then blending them with a little water in uh, a food processor is a great way to add some sweetening to something. What about and maple syrup and not Aunt Jemima's? Right, right. The real stuff. All right. Aunt Jemima's <laughs> is not maple syrup. Real maple syrup. That too has some. That too has some additional nutrient value, uh, just like blackstrap molasses or the the old time Southerners. That's got a huge amount of my, of minerals in it, and a maple syrup would also have some mineral. But what I found with maple syrup is it tends to be thinner than the Aunt Jemima and all the the old the syrups we used as a child, and so you have to be careful not to overload. I find it tastes a little bit sweeter than the other syrups that I've been exposed to. Now, I noticed you wrote banana puree in here. Mm-hmm. That can be used as a sweetener. It can be used as a base for, I, I actually demonstrated on my Facebook page, a, a banana nice cream or a pumpkin nice cream where I used p- pumpkin puree and frozen banana slices as the basis for an ice cream. So bananas are a great way to you know, sweeten a smoothie, to add the puree, and just like banana bread I used to make when I was little, that was the sweetening. We probably still added sugar, but that was a main source of sweetening. So it, it can be used in baking as well um, and still hold up a, a consistency. Yeah, it's a great book. A lot of good recipes in here. It's a nice, relaxing read. That was my goal. I didn't want it to feel like it was a scholarly piece, like it was not reachable for, the, for anybody that wanted to pick it up. And I offer a Facebook page, Facebook group as in support of those who go through and are working through the edits to give some other, you know, other support with a, another group. And then I also offer an editing companion they can request that's a 10 page workbook, basically, to process the information that they're getting and how they want to use those edits. Sometimes people just do well putting things in writing to get it, you know, fixed in their brain. But you can take it at your pace. You know, you you can do one edit at a time. I finished the book by saying, where are you going to start? What's the first edit you're going to do? It's more than just reading the book. You got to put it into action. You got to put it, you know, do something with it. And so pick one, just one, and start with that. And then after you get comfortable with that, you can look to adding another edit. And then just process little by little. You can really change significantly your lifestyle, your habits related to food in a simple step-by-step way. That's sustainable. That's my whole goal is make this sustainable. sustainable. Kelly, thank you so much for taking the time today to be with me. I will put in the show notes, the Facebook group, uh, where to find you, where to find the book, where to find your website was pursuewellness4u.com will be in the show notes. One question I have before you leave, mm-hmm. and I ask all my guests. If you were to pick one album to listen to and you had an hour to kill, what album or artist or album or artist would it be? I think if I wanted to just relax and take care of myself and 
calm my mind, it would be Josh Groban. Oh, good. Yeah. Uh, Josh, he's got an amazing voice. He has an amazing voice and he uses it like an instrument. Yeah, And exactly. I just enjoy all of the pieces I, I listen to of his. Uh, well. That's a good choice. Good choice. All right. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you. I, appreciate I really it. appreciate the opportunity. Thanks oh, so much. You're welcome. Thank you for joining in today with the Rebel Health Coach, Tom Underwood. And be sure to subscribe to the show so you can catch all the episodes. With desire and commitment, you can implement a lifestyle of wellness and fitness. For the support, encouragement, and tools you need to be successful, visit TomUnderwood.net.